Denver Snuffer, polygamy reductionist and non-transparencyist. On September 27, 2020, Denver Snuffer posted a podcast entitled The Foolish and the Wise, comprising over 7,500 words in an hour and three minutes. It argues that Joseph Smith never practiced polygamy. Before examining the podcast's message, the spectrum of teaching methodologies typically employed to discuss historical controversies should be reviewed. At one end of the spectrum are reductionists, and at the other end are transparencyists. Reductionists reduce the discussion of a controversy to a small number of evidences and interpretations that are offered by the teacher like breadcrumbs that can be followed one by one to the teacher's conclusion. Transparencyists, on the other hand, seek to provide all of the pertinent data to be transparent with the historical records. By presenting all of the evidences, transparencyists earn the right to interpret them and even write articles and books based upon that data. Transparencyists seek not to win an argument, but to help others and themselves find the truth. Observers may disagree, but they do it by quoting the very same evidences that the transparencyist originally presented. The Foolish and the Wise podcast by Denver Snuffer takes the broad question of Joseph Smith's polygamy and reduces it to two primary discussion points. For over 17 minutes, a letter written by Joseph Smith to the Relief Society is analyzed. According to Joseph Smith's journal, it was written March 31, 1842, and then was copied into the Relief Society minutes after a September 28th entry. The letter explains, quote, we do not want anyone to believe anything as coming from us contrary to the old established morals and virtues and scriptural laws regulating the habits, customs, and conduct of society. End of quote. Then, a statement found in the original but not in the Relief Society copy states, quote, Unless it be by message delivered to you by our own mouth by actual revelation and commandment. End of quote. Denver Snuffer criticizes Joseph Smith Papers editors for privileging the original over a copy that was apparently recorded later, but this is standard editing practice. Regardless, after citing the letter, Denver concludes, quote, You can read the letter and the version that was hand-copied by Eliza R. Snow into the Relief Society minutes, and you will conclude that Joseph Smith utterly rejects plural wives, every spiritual wives, polygamy and condemns anyone who could advocate it, end of quote. To support this conclusion, two additional discourses are briefly referenced, but the reductionist technique employed in the podcast does not provide chronological transparency. If we look at the timeline and identify all the men and women who are documented to have entered authorized polygamy in Nauvoo, we see that 115 Latter-day Saints entered the practice. If we turn that timeline on its side, we discover that in April of 1842, Joseph Smith was the only authorized polygamist in Nauvoo. He could easily, at that time, speak against any polygamy or any behavior called spiritual wifery because he knew it was unauthorized. The second point discussed for 26 minutes in the podcast involves the happiness letter. It begins, quote, Happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. End of quote. It has 736 words and, ironically, never mentions polygamy. It was published by John C. Bennett in the Sangamo Journal on August 19, 1842, and reprinted in his book, History of the Saints, a few months later. 
Denver Snuffer is critical of the Joseph Smith Papers editors of Documents Volume 9, who included the transcript of the letter in an appendix, suggesting Joseph Smith might have been its author. It is the most contemptible part of the entire volume, according to Denver Snuffer. But the fact that it is in an appendix demonstrates that the editors were cautious in their treatment, since it was not directly attributed to Joseph Smith. To support his position, Denver Snuffer quotes several historical evidences. But he never asks the question, who else could have authored it? The answer appears to be nobody. John C. Bennett could never have composed over 700 words to incriminate Joseph Smith as a polygamist without ever mentioning the word or the practice. His style was in-your-face accusations and hyperbole. Similarly, no one else associated with the event had the skills or motives. A second question, did Joseph Smith teach the basic principles in the letter and other discourses? is easily answered by looking at the principles taught in the letter and comparing them to Joseph Smith's other teachings. Since the letter never mentions polygamy, the general principles it conveys are those Joseph taught before and after the letter was published. A transparency is seeking to understand Nauvoo marital practices would be interested in all the pertinent data including notarized affidavits from eyewitnesses. Zina Huntington declared she was married or sealed to Joseph Smith, but Zina is not the only plural wife who signed such a legal document. Other affidavits declare the same thing signed by Almira Johnson, Presendia Huntington, Martha McBride, Ruth Vos Sayer, Eliza Partridge, and her sister Emily Partridge. This is not all. Miranda Johnson signed a similar document saying she was married or sealed to Joseph Smith. So did Melissa Lott, Sarah Ann Whitney, Eliza R. Snow, Desdemona Fulmer, and Rhoda Richards. Lucy Walker described her relationship plainly. I was a plural wife of the prophet Joseph Smith. In an 1881 letter to her family, Helen Mark Kimball told how her father arranged for her to be sealed to Joseph Smith at age 14 in what turned out to be more of a betrothal since he died the following year and there is no evidence the two were ever alone together after the ceremony. Besides these legal statements, Eliza R. Snow wrote the names of a half dozen more in a document collected by historian Andrew Jensen. Many of these sealings were eternity only and non-sexual, but others were for time and eternity. When asked under oath in the Temple Lot litigation, did you ever room with Joseph Smith as his wife? Melissa Lott declared, yes, sir. In the same litigation, and while under oath, Emily Partridge was asked, Did you ever have carnal intercourse with Joseph Smith? To which she answered, Undoubtedly mortified to admit such intimacies in a public setting. Yes, sir. Lucy Walker attempted to dodge the question, Did you ever live with Joseph Smith as his wife? By answering, He was my husband, sir. Other questions and answers made it clear that Lucy's marriage to Joseph could have resulted in offspring. Many other eyewitnesses recalled Joseph Smith teaching and practicing plural marriage. While under oath, Wilford Woodruff recounted, Joseph Smith, of course, taught that principle while in Nauvoo, and he not only taught it, but practiced it too. I heard him teach it. He taught it to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and he taught it to other individuals as they bear testimony. Apostle George A. Smith recalled, At one of the first interviews, after returning from his mission to England with Joseph Smith, I was greatly astonished at hearing from his lips that doctrine of patriarchal marriage, which he continued to preach to me from time to time. 
Howard Corey, who knew Joseph Smith, affirmed that he taught about a plurality of wives in Nauvoo. John Taylor declared, When this principle was first made known to us by Joseph Smith, it was in Nauvoo, and many of you will remember the place very well. We were assembled in the little office over the brick store. John W. Rigdon, Nancy Rigdon's brother, corroborated in a notarized affidavit Joseph Smith's proposal of plural marriage to Nancy. Benjamin Johnson declared, I do know that at Joseph Smith's mansion home was living Maria and Sarah Lawrence and one of Cornelius Lott's daughters as his plural wives. Joseph Kelting recalled his first discussion with Joseph Smith. He began a defense of the doctrine by referring to the Old Testament. I told him I did not want to hear that as I could read it for myself. He then informed me that he had received a revelation from God which taught the correctness of the doctrine of a plurality of wives and commanded him to obey it. He then acknowledged to having married several wives. Non-Mormon Sarah Scott in a June 16, 1844 letter wrote, Joseph had a revelation last summer purporting to be from the Lord, allowing the saints the privilege of having ten living wives at one time. These eight individuals left over twenty statements that Joseph Smith was commanded by an angel with a sword to restore plural marriage. Anti-Mormons who never would have been part of a conspiracy to help Joseph Smith or Brigham Young, provide contemporary evidence. In a June 7, 1844 edition of the Nauvoo Expositor, William Law accused Joseph Smith of practicing a plurality of wives. He corroborated this in later interviews as well. John C. Bennett accused Joseph Smith of plural marriage in 1842 in a publication and even provided coded names of the women and actual names of the men who performed the ordinances. Bennett was a known prevaricator, but participants later confirmed several of his accusations. For example, Bennett said Joseph B. Noble married Joseph Smith to Miss L. B. with asterisks that parallel Louisa Beeman's name, and Noble later verified the 1841 sealing ceremony in a signed affidavit. When antagonists and believers agree on historical events, the credibility of those events is enhanced. What about the revelation on a plurality of wives, now Doctrine and Covenants, section 132? William Clayton recorded in his journal on July 12, 1843, this a.m. I wrote a revelation consisting of ten pages on the order of the priesthood, showing the designs in Moses, Abraham, David, and Solomon having many wives. Joseph C. Kingsbury reported under oath, Newell K. Whitney handed me the revelation and asked me to make a copy of it. I did so. This copy in Kingsbury's handwriting exists today and has a clear provenance. Cyrus Wheelock recounted how Joseph Smith had the revelation read to a group of three or four of, or five together. Six men left the statements recalling how the revelation was read to the Nauvoo High Council on August 12, 1843, including Leonard Sobey. Leonard Sobey later left the church but never denied hearing the revelation read in 1843. The reports from the other five are also available. Many other men and women left record of seeing, hearing, or reading the Revelation during Joseph Smith's lifetime. Besides those men and women, dozens of other documents could be included here showing Joseph Smith taught and practiced plural marriage, but hopefully these examples show the need to avoid reductionism in making evaluations. Denver Snuffer also teaches in the podcast that if Joseph Smith had engaged in polygamy, it would have been a secret, private, dishonest, culpable practice of the plural wife thing, or a private, secret, licentious, adulterous practice. This is a misrepresentation. Joseph F. Smith, who was Joseph Smith's nephew, 
and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1903, wrote, It is difficult to convince the prejudiced mind that any but base intents and impure desires prompted the practice of plural marriage, but nevertheless it was entered into, God knows, with the highest religious and moral motives. Margaret Thompson Smoot recalled, I have seen the prophet Joseph, through whom the principle was revealed. I have listened to his teachings. I have known for myself of his virtue, of his purity, of his goodness, and his desire to elevate and bless the human family. Phoebe Woodruff, wife of Wilford Woodruff, remembered in 1878, It has been upwards of 40 years since my first acquaintance with these doctrines, this people, and the prophet Joseph Smith. I knew him to be an honorable, virtuous, and pure man. Lorenzo Snow affirmed, I was personally acquainted with Joseph Smith, the prophet, during 12 or 14 years, by whom I was first taught this doctrine, and I knew him to be a man of truth and honor. Helen Mark Kimball Whitney wrote, The prophet said many unprincipled men would take advantage of it, but that did not prove that it was not a pure principle. If Joseph had any impure desires, he could have gratified them in the style of the world with less danger to his life or his character than to do as he did. The Lord commanded him to teach and practice that principle. Nobel laureate and non-Latter-day Saint George Bernard Shaw summarized, Now nothing can be more idle, nothing more frivolous, than to imagine that this polygamy had anything to do with personal licentiousness. If Joseph Smith had proposed to the Latter-day Saints that they should live licentious lives, they would have rushed on him and probably anticipated their pious neighbors who presently shot him. Joseph Smith established plural marriage as a religious practice. The podcast accuses those who say Joseph Smith practiced plural marriage of calling him a hypocrite and a liar. Many people argue that he denied practicing polygamy. I've written an article on this looking at all of his statements and it can be downloaded at mormonpolygamydocuments.org. Joseph Smith never stated in unambiguous language that plural marriage in all places and at all times was sinful. Doing so would have condemned Old Testament patriarchs Abraham and Jacob. When looking at the documented evasive statements, it is interesting to view how creatively Joseph, Hiram, and other polygamists tried not to lie, while not divulging the details of a secret religious practice that, if known, would have brought down persecution upon the church, its members, and leaders. Returning now to reductionism and transparencyism, how do reductionists respond to the additional historical documents that may contradict their position? One reaction is to dismiss them as late recollections. It is true that time diminishes the ability to remember details, but few people would forget basic historical events like Joseph Smith's teaching and promoting plural marriage. A second approach is to dismiss the evidences as too biased to be useful. Everyone has biases, but the Latter-day Saints who left dozens of signed affidavits were devout Christians who would not have easily been persuaded to lie in legal documents even to protect Brigham Young's reputation. In addition, many former Latter-day Saints and anti-Mormons corroborated their claims, and they never would have joined in a conspiracy to hide the truth. It seems that reductionists generally ignore the evidences, apparently hoping that those following their breadcrumb scholarship will too. Reductionists may say that transparency betrays good scholarship, betrays the historical record, betrays the truth, or in this case, even betrays Joseph Smith. This is not true. In reality, Transparency seems only to betray the opinion of the reductionist. Sometimes, reductionists threaten those who seek transparency. Denver Snuffer warns me personally 
as well as editors at the Joseph Smith Papers Project. You need to repent. You need to undo the mischief that you have done. And if you fail to do so, you do that at the peril of your own salvation. It raises the question, is transparency mischief? Joseph Smith taught truth is a knowledge of things as they are and as they were and as they are to come. The Savior promised the truth shall make you free, self-limiting the number of allowable documents and research leads to confusion, not truth. At 12 minutes and 20 seconds, Denver Snuffer makes an interesting statement. There is no evidence that Joseph intended for this practice to ever be made public, even if you think it originated with him. It's a damned lie to attribute this as though it were something Joseph intended to be made public. Despite the remainder of the podcast, it seems to say Joseph Smith was not involved with the practice of polygamy. This sentence tells us that he was, but intended for the practice to not be made public. And Denver uses profanity to drive home that point. However, multiple records demonstrate that Joseph Smith intended for plural marriage to eventually be practiced publicly. Joseph Lee Robinson remembered, while speaking to the people, Joseph Smith said, Suppose we send one of our elders to Turkey or India or to a people where it was lawful to have several wives. Joseph explained what would happen. The laws in Zion are such that you can bring your wives and enjoy them here as well as there. The prophet went to his dinner, and as might be expected, several of the first women of the church collected at the prophet's house with his wife and said, Oh, Mr. Smith, you have done it now. It will never do, for it is all blasphemy. You must take back what you have said today. It is outrageous. It would ruin us as a people. Joseph returned to the stand in the afternoon and took back what he had said, leaving it as though there had been nothing said. Helen Mark Kimball recalled that on one occasion in Nauvoo, Joseph astonished his hearers by preaching on the restoration of all things and said that as it was anciently with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so it would be again. Lucy Walker remembered that after her plural sealing to Joseph Smith, he said, Although I cannot under existing circumstances acknowledge you as my wife, the time is near when we will go beyond the Rocky Mountains and then you will be acknowledged and honored as my wife. Declaring in this podcast, that Joseph Smith intended to keep the practice of plural marriage secret seems to be at cross purposes with the overall message, but it is also incorrect. In review, of all the evidences showing Joseph Smith introduced and practiced plural marriage, the Foolish and the Wise podcast deals primarily with two documents of very minor importance to anyone seeking to discover the marital practices of Joseph Smith and the other Latter-day Saints in Nauvoo in the early 1840s. A research technique that casts such a meager investigative net will invariably produce conclusions of limited usefulness. In addition, it probably will not justify the warnings of damnation repeatedly directed to those who disagree. As someone who has spent a great deal of time with the historical manuscripts pertinent to Nauvoo polygamy, here are a few observations. When dealing with the historical documents and events, transparency serves the cause of truth better than reductionism. Transparency reveals that plural marriage was a religious practice for Joseph Smith and over a hundred other men and women who participated prior to the martyrdom. Learning church history by reading the primary documents creates a special space for belief and faith. Believing is more difficult when the original historical sources are filtered through false teachers or unbelievers. Joseph Smith taught false prophets always arise to oppose the true prophets, 
and they will prophesy so very near the truth that they will deceive almost the very chosen ones. I apologize for the amateurish nature of this video, but hope the information presented here can be useful to anyone seeking to know the truth about Joseph Smith and plural marriage.